Well, hello and welcome. Today's episode is part of a bigger project I am currently working on. I am developing and building my own Geiger counter based upon a Raspberry Pi Pico. It features long-term measurements and even VGA output for visualization of beta and gamma radiation over time. Plus, a nice voice alarm as you can see in this little preview. Warning. Hazardous radiation levels detected. Warning. Hazardous radiation levels detected. However, it is of course possible to utilize this VFD for your very own project since it is controlled by an Atmega 328P aka Arduino Uno and it is built modular. Daily dose of playing the guitar, check. Okay, here's a quick overview. This first episode will cover the VF display unit, including the schematics and providing the source code. The second episode is all about the basic interpreter and the mainboard of Project X. A small note, it is not called Project X because of the Geiger counter or even X-rays, Nope, it's called Project X because it is just a core plus a shell for any Project X you can imagine. On the back side I left two expansion slots for modules you can add. On the front there are three pretty generic labeled buttons and the nice old school vacuum fluorescence display from this episode. The third and final episode deals with the Geiger Counter expansion board, which you can also use as a standalone unit, the software I wrote for it, and of course some serious radiation tests from real uranium. Now let's have a look at my schematics of the VFD power supply. On the left side we have a generic A-stable multi-vibrator circuit based on the famous NE555, which generates the anode voltage of approximately 36 volts DC from just 5 volts input. You can adjust the voltage via this potentiometer. Also, it is important to use a N-channel MOSFET with a low RDS on, for example the IRLZ44N, followed by an ultra-fast rectifier diode. Those two components are somewhat critical to achieve the high anode voltage with minimal losses. C4 and C5 then filter some ripple. And these two 18 volt Zener diodes in series are for protection of the display. On the oscilloscope I saw in my earlier versions some overshoots up to 60 volts for a fractal of a second due to the power on phase of the NE555. So my design went through some iterations. As you can see I've even etched my own PCBs for prototyping. But for the final version, which I assembled today, the professional PCB is more sophisticated. Going to the top, JP1 is just a switch or you might even jump at it. It is to shut down or activate the anode and filament supply, while keeping alive the internal display controller. The Schottky diode D1 prevents from backward current from the inductor and gives some polarity protection. On the right side we see the AC filament supply circuit. The reason for AC is because the filament doesn't like DC voltages, it also results in a better brightness distribution. Therefore a NAND gate with Schmidt trigger inputs of C2 is used to generate an AC voltage which is then fed into the filaments via a 6.8 ohms resistor, but on the other filament side without any resistor. I left it as an option on the PCB I've designed, so you can adjust it to your liking. Those resistors are limiting the current through the filament. This way you can adjust a too bright glowing filament. In general, you should not see the filament glow in normal daylight. And this is my final PCB. Every component is well labeled, so it shouldn't be a problem to build it. The Gerber files are in my video description. So now let's saw some parts and start soldering. Uh, let's see if my wooden tower have some spare capacitors for me. And 
Moving over to the silicon magazines. I designed this trimmer pot outline in a way you can choose different component sizes and shapes. For example, these are really high quality Dale trimmer pots, made in France, probably in the late 80s, I guess. Soldering almost done. Now I'm preparing the VFD. See this metalized looking area here? This is called getter. It is a reactive material for keeping the vacuum and indicate if it sucks air. But wait, I've prepared something for you. This poor guy has lost its vacuum due to overheating resulting in a horizontal cut. This white area on the top of the tube is the getter, but faded to white. So if your display looks like this, it's broken. Let's cut some legs with scissors. Unconventional but effective. Double-sided tape is helping to fit some isolation between the glass and the PCB. It is important to cover that round metalized material on the back, otherwise it will short out the display. I've temporarily mounted the PCB with a loose display onto the front panel. This way we can push it right onto the panel and then solder it into place. It gives a seamless fit. If you want to put acrylic in between, this is the right time for doing so. And the last soldering part, the male header pins and the connector for JP1, which switches the anode and filament supply. Here I soldered wire because they lead to the front panel switch. So let's test this beauty. The alligator clip is simulating my switch. And the pin header is connected to the corresponding Arduino pins. Yay, I would call this a success. Let's try some text over cereal. In the final project, this will be the part of the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now I'm using my computer. Now I'm checking the anode voltage. It's a little bit low. Let's take care of it with my all-time favorite tool. And no, it's not the soldering iron. It's my trusty Swiss army knife. And that being said, as a German. Just a few turns and let's check it again. This looks good, but there is still one more thing to do. What the voltmeter can't do is checking for transients. So let's fire up the oscilloscope. 
I'm setting up the scope for a single shot trigger on the rising edge of about 3.6 volts. Meaning that as soon as I connect the alligator clip, the anode voltage starts to climb, the scope is set to trigger when the signal gets over 3.6 volts and then stops automatically for me so I can analyze this short moment in time. The reason behind is to see if there's any overshoot to higher voltages than allowed. Beautiful. The Zener dials take their job serious. Now, since everything's working, it's a bit silly to stick an Arduino Uno bot onto the display. That's why I've designed a controller bot too. It goes piggyback right on the supply board. Let's take a look at the schematic. It allows us to simply drive this beauty by I2C or Serial. For my Project X I use Serial Communication to send data to the display. Because I'm driving it with a Raspberry Pi Pico, there's a need for a level shifter, which converts the 3.3 Serial TX line from the Pico to 5 volt Serial for the Atmega 328P. Nothing fancy. It's based upon the good available 2N7000 MOSFET. And here's a display firmware. It is based on the work of Kurt Schuster. It drives the display via SPI. But since we would lose too many pins of the Raspberry Pi Pico, I decided to convert it to I2C and Serial with my firmware and add some commands I am showing you right now. So if the master, in my case, the Raspberry Pi Pico, sends this command via Serial, it is recognized as an instruction for the display to scroll through the characters. The 000 indicates that scrolling is turned off. The value behind SCR is the amount of delay in the scrolling effect. You can also set the brightness. It is internally regulated via PWM. And of course you can modify it and even add own commands. The source code is in the video description below. Okay, that's it for today's episode. In the next one we'll move over to the design considerations of Project X. Till then, stay safe and auf Wiedersehen!